So everybody, just as you're eating and enjoying the fantastic food from Tapestry, I really, I have to give a really heartfelt thank you to Lisa and Amanda for these creations. Hold on, we're just gonna, you guys are yeah. here. Perfect. So Lisa and Amanda, thank you so much for, for helping us organize this. Thank you everybody for coming. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Irene Kishansky. Uh, my real estate team, the KB real estate team is here helping Nicoletta and Bridget. We've got our wonderful speakers, Jeff Hartley of RBC Financial and Richard and Catherine from Levitt. My Bindur and Graham. Thank you, thank you. Please don't ask me to, <laughs> don't to memorize that. Uh, so uh, what we're, we're really aiming to do here today is help you get as much education information as we possibly can. Uh, downsizing at any stage in life is can be challenging, and uh, it's so important to have the right people around you, the right team to help you with whatever it is that uh, you are trying to achieve. So we'll do our best to give you as much information as we can here in our uh, limited amount of time. Uh, this is not a sales presentation of any sort, uh, but of course, if you have sales related questions, there's lots of folks here to help you with that. And in your brochures, you have the contact information for all of our speakers and a room for notes. If you'd like to make some notes um, on, on what they're speaking about. And uh, of course, they are always open to your questions after the fact. Uh, now, the environment being what it is, we have some folks that couldn't make it due to illnesses. Uh, one of those people is actually uh, our fourth speaker, Teresa Kozowski. Uh, she was going to be speaking to us on decluttering, and unfortunately, she's home uh, with an illness. So you get me. I'm going to do my best. I, I prepared last minute, so uh, hopefully I'll be able to, to give you the same level of entertainment and enjoyment as, as she would have. Uh, however, her contact information is also in, in your brochure. Uh, those of you who are joining us on Zoom, if you have some questions, please put them in the chat. Uh, we'll do our best to monitor it. And for those of you that are watching this on the recording, please feel free to reach out to us at any time uh, with any specific questions. So before I hand the floor over to our speakers, uh, does anyone have any specific questions, uh, sort of burning questions that you really, really want to make sure that you get answered today? We will have something. They might have something ahead of time. So great. All right. <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, so our order of presentation, we're going to have uh, Richard and Catherine talk about wills and powers of attorney, uh, and then uh, Jeff speaking about uh, creating a fi financial plan. Uh, so Richard, Catherine, Jeff, do you want to? The chairs are here. I feel like they're inviting me to sit. You can, Hi, you can sit, you can stand, whatever makes you feel, for, feel comfortable. Why not? Okay, so my name is Richard Levitt. This is Catherine Montagnese, and we are the firm called Levitt, Mike Mandur, and Graham. We're about a five minute drive from here. Uh, the firm has been in Etobicoke for about 60 years almost. It was started by my dad. And we do wills and estates, we do family law, we do real estate, and we do corporate law. And we're going to talk to you today about wills. And Catherine is going to tell you uh, why you need a will. Yeah, super important. So um, just there's like a few main reasons why you may want to consider getting a will if you don't have one and powers of attorney as well. They're both super important documents that really help with um, just basically what happens after the fact and it's so important to, to plan this in advance and there's a number of reasons a number of reasons why and the first one I would say is you want to be able to decide what will happen so if something does happen to you you want to be able to make that choice for yourself rather than have others make it for you whether it be a number of family members or the government or whoever you want to be able to have that decision yourself so in order to make that decision yourself you have to do it by way of will or power of attorney ahead of the time so um Basically, um, you want to choose who is responsible for making these decisions for you. You want to choose what's going to happen to your state, that kind of thing. So um, it's important to have that in writing and 
the reason why you may speak with a lawyer to do it is so that we can go, go, go through those options, talk about maybe your family dynamics, the different um, considerations, depending on what your circumstances are, your family circumstances, that kind of thing. So that's sort of one of the main reasons why we, we would say it's important to have wills and powers of attorney done. And um, both, both of those documents are so important as well. Um, as well as um, another really main reason why we think people really definitely should have wills and powers of attorney is to make things easier for your loved ones. So like I was saying, if there's sort of different family dynamics, you may want to consider um, whether people get along, who's better suited to things. Um, you don't want them to be fighting or a bunch of people fighting after you're gone about things. And we do see that happen quite a lot. Unfortunately, it's it can end up being really messy, even if you don't think it will be. Um, having it in writing always really does help with those things. So no, I, I would just add that often people say, how do we prevent prevent somebody from challenging our will or how do we pe prevent people from fighting? And the simple answer to that is you just get a will. Mm -hmm. If you have a will, it's a very good reason to, a very good way to prevent people from fighting because you have a legal document in place showing exactly what should happen. So, um, you know, often clients come to us uh, after they have seen somebody pass away without a will and they see what a mess that that situation is and they say, you know what, I don't wanna be in that same situation. So that's why we've come to see you. So, uh, you know, one of the things I want you to take away from this talk is that not only do you need a will, but it should be up to date because we have a lot of clients who have wills that are five, 10, 15, 20, 30, 40 years old. Um, they don't make any sense anymore. They're not up to date with the legal um, legislation with the most up-to-date laws. And, um, you know, people they have in their wills have either passed away or they've moved away or they haven't spoken to them, or maybe the wills aren't drafted properly. Uh, maybe they went to a lawyer who doesn't do them that often. There's just so many reasons why you don't only need a will, but you need a will that's up to date. Um, and even if you think your will is fine, it's a good idea just to look it over and make sure it is okay. Um, you can take it to a lawyer to review um, the cost to have a lawyer review it. Some lawyers don't charge the cost sometimes there's often, you know, very reasonable just to review it and maybe everything's okay and you don't need to make any changes. Um, but like I said, people see uh, how messy things can be if you don't have a will that's up to date or if you don't have a will at all. So uh, that's really the main takeaway from today, I would say. Yeah, and just keeping in mind how things can change over time as well, right? Like what, what your family circumstances may have been, you know, five, 10 years ago and not the same that they'll be like 10, 20 years from now. So that's something just to keep in mind as well to constantly review them and just make sure that they're still, they work for what you want. Um, and then another reason why you would, would have wills done and particularly speak with a lawyer about it is because there are numbers of ways that you can structure your assets in order to have tax savings. Like there's something called a state tax, which is um, charged on by the government on the value of your estate. So there's a number of ways you can maybe hold assets differently depending on what your intentions are. So speaking with a lawyer can help you with respect to sort of joint assets or registered assets, stuff like that, where we can talk to you about your particular circumstances and deal with um, how you can save save taxes and also just making sure that they're all in alignment, right? Because if your will says one thing and then um, your, your beneficiaries designations are something else, you wanna make sure that that's all um, across the board the same that way there's no confusion there's no room for fighting after the fact um you're getting sort of some tax considerations in there that, that make you think about you know where you want your money to go who's paying for what that kind of thing so it's something to consider as well um and in terms of other assets too if you have like businesses or special things with properties that you want to discuss it's an important thing to to talk to lawyers about or just get some advice if you, if you do feel like you may need it that's something that is um, important for most people um, and then another reason I would say in terms of those along those same lines, in terms of sort of special considerations, if you do have any um, special things that you may want in there, like trusts, or if you have sort of minors that you want to uh, protect or have trusts for minors, that kind of thing, guardianship, all of those things are, are definitely other considerations where it's helpful to have that properly drafted and to make sure that it's in alignment with with what your wishes are really and, and the best scenario for your family going forward. Yeah, I, I would just add that um, a lot of people think that their situation is a lot more straightforward than it really is. And we find that when clients sit down with us and they say everything's going to be straightforward and simple and we start asking them some basic questions, uh, we find out that maybe uh, there's somebody who's disabled or there might be somebody who's not great with money or somebody who might have a gambling or an alcohol issue or a drug issue or 
all sorts of things that can go off in so many different ways. Um, so, you know, really those things should be addressed in the will. Those things don't take care of themselves. Things don't happen as automatically as some people might think they do. Um, and um, just to go back to your earlier point about making sure all of your assets are consistently owned from an estate planning perspective, uh, what we do is when we have a client who's doing a will is we have people fill out this worksheet um, that tells us who you are, your birth date, you relate, you know, your, whether you're married, your kids, who your kids are, their birth dates. Uh, and we ask you, you know, how, what, what your assets are, do you own a house, do you have bank accounts? Uh, sometimes people look at this worksheet, they find it a little bit daunting. They say, this is, this is a lot of work. Um, the truth is we just need the basics for these worksheets and they give us a snapshot of how everything's set up. Um, and we want to make sure that there are assets um, that aren't going to be governed by your will, because there are certain assets that you know, may not be governed by your will, uh, like assets where you designate beneficiaries, like Catherine said. Um, you know, if you have a tax-free savings account and you designate a beneficiary on that account, that will go directly to the beneficiary that you designated. It doesn't go through your estate and your will isn't going to have anything to do with that, for example. So we want to make sure that all of the assets that are not covered by your will are going to be handled consistently with the assets that are covered by your will uh, to make sure that everything's going to be handled in a proper way and that your entire estate plan is consistent. Mm -hmm. And it's so important too, if there are specific assets like RRSPs or RIFs that you have designated beneficiaries, there are also tax consequences that are associated with those assets. And you want to think about who's paying for those tax consequences. Is it the estate? Is it the beneficiary? How is that? Is that equal? Is that fair? How does that play out basically? So that's sort of something we, we can take a look at as well with, with what's in the worksheet. But like Richard said, it's, it sounds more daunting than it is. I think a lot of people get a little bit overwhelmed by it, but it's really straightforward at the end of the day. We just ask some simple questions, go through your scenarios and, and give you sort of the best advice and the best plan for your specific needs. So um, that's normally the, the process in terms of straightforward. And there's a number of other reasons why why you'd want a will done. And, and I, I would just say like one other main one is if there are any potential issues, medical issues or reasons why it could be challenged, like capacity challenges, anything like that. It's so important to have it done like in a legal document and that a lawyer's done um, done it for you. That way you don't have any risks of it being invalidated because you don't want to have a document done if it's not worth what, you know, if no one's going to accept it, if it's not going to actually be worth anything at the end of the day. So um, having having sort of proper advice and going through the proper channels really to help with that, making sure it's valid and making sure it, it holds up to any potential future challenges. No. Okay. <laughs> that was good. Okay. So maybe before you move on to the the power of attorney piece, uh, when it comes to choosing an executor, mm -hmm. and especially when there are when there's more than one child um, that you designate as executor, if you're designating a child, uh, what we've come across in the past is uh, some older folks making children co-executors mm -hmm. because they believe that will help um, run things smoothly and it ends up being a little bit the reverse. So uh, how would you address that if someone came to you and said they'd like to have co-executors in a will? I think sometimes people think that bestowing the honor of being an executor on their children is some grand gesture mm -hmm. or some uh, gesture of love, and they don't want to insult any children by not designating them as an executor. Uh, that's not the case, unfortunately. It's a lot of work, a lot of headaches, potentially, and it's a very practical decision about who you choose as your executor. So you want to pick somebody who's financially responsible, somebody who's communicative with the family, somebody who preferably gets along with the family, um, and somebody who's going to do a good job, you know, somebody who can meet with a lawyer, somebody who can meet with a real estate agent to sell a property, somebody who's responsible paying bills. Um, and if you have, if you, if you honestly look at your children and you say, well, one of them's better at these things than the other, uh, you might want to consider choosing the child who's more responsible and who's more willing to do the job. So the best thing to do is to have a frank discussion with your family and say, this is what we've been told to do, or this is what we've been advised to do. And uh, what do you guys think? Or, you know, that's the best thing is to be transparent with, with your family and, and give them a heads up in advance and let them know what you're thinking. So the will isn't a shock to them when they see what you've done. Um, you do want to pick people who get along. 
uh, if they don't get along, it can be a problem. And we'll explain to clients what those problems might entail. And a worst case scenario, it ends up in court. So um, generally, you know, we talk through all the different scenarios and the options with the clients, and we try and come up with the best solution that they're comfortable uh, signing off on. Yeah, and like Richard said, it's not about being equals. Um, like you can still treat them equally in the will in terms of the distribution and still have different executors. It's a job at the end of the day. Sorry, you had a question? Yeah. Uh -huh. Our will is with a lawyer in the will yet. Now we moved down here, suppose we did another 10 years. We forgot where it is. Kids don't know where it is. How is a will with that balance? That's a great question. So, you want to, you know, if you think about wills, a very basic premise of, of having a will is knowing where your will is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and we have a lot of clients who don't know where their wills are. So, you know, the first thing you do is you call the lawyer and you ask them if they have the will. So, I would say if you ask 12 lawyers whether they store wills or whether they give them back to clients, Six are going to tell you that they keep them, and six are going to tell you that they give them back to clients. Mine still has. Yours still has. How so do you I, find that lawyer? That's the question. Well, um, again, you know, a lot of this has to do with transparency and just open discussions with your kids. You know, like talking to them and letting them know, hey, listen, we have a will. A lot of kids don't know whether their parents have wills or not. Say, listen, we have a will, and this is the lawyer that we used. And if you ever need, if something ever happens to us. This is who you reach out to, and this is our accountant, and this is our financial advisor, and this is our real estate agent. And you can leave them a letter of instructions and say, here's a here's a list of people who you can contact. Um, I would call that lawyer and make sure they do have it. They probably do. Um, but you know, sometimes lawyers retire or they pass away or they move offices or somebody else takes on their practice, and wills can get lost in the shuffle that way. So I would, you know, if you haven't had any contact with this lawyer in the last 10 years. It can't hurt just to give them a call and make sure they still have it on file. Okay. Our, our personal practice is we actually give the wills back to clients. Yeah, we have a copy. Of the copy, so copies are only good for record keeping purposes. Yeah. They're not valid and you can't use those to apply to the courts or to give to a bank. You know, they're just, they're good because they let people know what your decisions were and they let people know that you do have a will, but you can't actually use it. It doesn't have any validity um, in terms of acting upon it. So I've got to find the original. The original carries all the weight. So yeah, if I were in your position, I would just call the lawyer and make sure they still have it. And let your executor know where it is. Yeah. Yeah. I was just thinking, and then you often have a designated uh, backup for executor, mm -hmm. who you should also apply. Yeah, exactly. In case the first executor is unable or unwilling at the time yeah. to do their duties. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Can we talk a little bit about probate? When you have the probate? Uh, so, um, probate is a process. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thanks for the word. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's an official court process. You have to make an application to the court, mm -hmm. and the executor gets authorized by the courts to act on behalf of the estate. Mm -hmm. And typically, you need to probate a will when an asset is frozen. It's the most common scenario. So somebody passes away, you go to the bank, you say, listen, my, my spouse or my mm -hmm. child or my parent, my friend had $50,000 in their account and here's their will and it says this $50,000 comes to me. And the bank says, well, we're freezing this account and we're not gonna give it to you until you get probate. Or let's say you have a house and I say, I own my house in my own name and I pass away. How is that house gonna get sold? Well, it can't get sold without probate. So there's an asset that's frozen. That's the most common scenario where people need it. And you can't get access to that asset until you go through the probate process. And the probate process in a nutshell is you're paying estate tax on the value of everything you own. Estate tax is about one and a half percent. So if you have a million dollars worth of assets, let's say you have a house that's worth $800,000 and you have $200,000 in the bank. So you have a million dollars worth of assets. You're paying $15,000 in estate tax. And you attach that to an application to the court and um, you apply and then you wait. And then that application gets put on somebody's desk and it sits on a pile for six to eight months. Depending on what court you're in. <laughs> yeah, depending on what court you're in. If, if it's a smaller town or if it's not Toronto, it can be a lot faster than that. But Toronto is very slow right now. Can you go around? Around well, that's, that, an easy way. There, there are certain ways of getting around it, um, but also in some instances, those ways of getting around it are actually more complicated and more expensive than getting around it. It could cause other problems. Yeah. 
it's so intense. that's that's another reason why you know a very common question we get asked is why should we get a will done through a lawyer and not do it online or not do it um you know there, there used to be wills called grand and toy wills but now there's more sophisticated wills that you can get done through the through um, the internet and you know benefits of seeing a lawyer is yeah we can have those discussions with you in some instances it does make sense to get around probate in some instances it doesn't um you know we do take a look at all of your assets to make sure they're structured pos properly which isn't something you would get from an online worksheet um but that's a whole other presentation yeah things are things are owned and joint is no problem things that are joint are generally <laughs> well, I am a lawyer, so I can only say 100% of the time. But generally speaking, holding assets jointly does help. No probate. No probate on a joint, especially with a spouse. Like if you own a property jointly with a spouse and yeah. one of you passes away, the survivor becomes the owner by right of survivorship. And that asset wouldn't be subject to probate until the survivor of the two of you passes. <clears throat> so you have a question back? Yeah. What are the tax implications for a beneficiary of your life insurance policy? There aren't any. So yeah. if you just leave somebody, uh, you know, if you have a life insurance policy that says $100,000 to my child, um, you know, that's a, a very good way in some instances of estate planning. And, you know, there's no tax on that. There's no estate tax on that. So they there's don't no... have to declare it as income or anything. It's like a gift. A gift. Yeah. Thank you. There's some questions. Yeah, so you mentioned that um, the original copy should be kept by the lawyer or the, the person. Can you not do both? So there's one original will. One original So copy. it's either kept with the lawyer or given back to the client. If we give it back to the client, it's really up to them how they want to store it. Often clients choose to keep it either in a safety deposit box, which is tricky because you always want to make sure that your executors have access to it. Yeah, exactly. So you never want to keep it there if people don't have access to it. Uh, or they have a fire safe box. They might buy something from Home Depot or Lowe's, you know, get one of these boxes that are fireproof and they keep their documents in there. Or often clients just have an important set of cabinets or a drawer or something where they keep their documents and they just tell their, their executors that's where things are being stored. And sometimes clients actually prefer to give it to their executors. That doesn't happen as often. And there's a lot of trust involved when you do that, but that's that's an option that's on the table as well. I also have a, a probate tax question just to add to, to Ruth's. We often write letters of value of opinion for properties so that they can be submitted for probate. And there seems to be two schools of thought about what happens between that valuation and when the property actually sells. So there are some attorneys that say there's going to be a capital gain no matter what, and others that say, well, we, the courts understand that a value upon death may not be the same as when you sell because you'll fix up the property, you'll make it look nicer. So if the value is higher by any, whether it's a small amount or a large amount, are the beneficiaries subject to capital gains tax? So I can tell you what I think. <laughs> you know, what we tell everybody is we're not tax advisors and it's always important to have an accountant to advise you on these types of issues. I know when I've spoken to my accountants, what I've been advised is that if somebody passes away on December 1st and their property is worth a million dollars and the property sells, let's say within the next six months, often the real estate market hasn't fluctuated that much six months. Um, and you can get away with just declaring that the property sold in six months is still the same value it was when the person passed away. That doesn't always make sense because sometimes there are wild fluctuations in the, in the market and that may not make sense. I think really at the end of the day, you have to talk to the accountant and figure out what the best way of attacking that problem is. I wish I had a better answer than that. But the, I'd have to, well, I'd have to pass it just that one proves the, the point that my question is there. It's a good, it's it's a good not, question. It's not a clear answer. But you know, the, the longer you own the property, um the more of a question that becomes if it sells very quickly then it's less of an issue but if you hold on to it for a year or two years or three years then it becomes more of an issue jeff is there just saying accounting accounting is my prior life and they would say that it's the date they could even if it was six months after the account yes for its, its value on the date of passing yeah they would stick pretty close to that. And, and, and the, the rest of the assets, whether it's financial assets or real estate, would be taxable to the estate. 
Mm -hmm. The answer is if you find yourself in a situation, just make sure you get advice that's pertinent to you. And one specific question about uh, the executor. Mm -hmm. uh, it's customary to the executor a certain amount of money just to write these letters, right? Depends. Just it's it's then, some people do it, some people the, don't. The, some people do and some people don't. Um, yeah. If you do leave executor money, then it is taxed to them as income. Okay. And so it is fairly customary to do so? So in the legislation, you as an executor, whether or not somebody says anything about compensation in the will, you're entitled to compensation. So often people don't mention it in their will because they just rely on the legislation and they say the executor can charge whatever is reasonable. There's a guide. There's no flat rule, but there's a guide that an executor can charge up to 5% of the estate. Um, and that's 2.5% of everything that comes in, 2.5% of everything that goes out. 5% is, is the high end. Not to say you can't charge more than that, but typically that's the high end and that's reserved for complicated estates with complicated assets oh. and fighting among the beneficiaries. Lots of work. So again, a good example of more specific you can be in your will, the less the head is being spread. Yeah, you can yeah. say something in your will. You can say $20,000 to my executor, yeah. for instance. But it's in some scenarios, if, if the executor is also the beneficiary, it may not make sense. So it really is so case dependent. Um, if the executor is not a beneficiary, then that's maybe a scenario where they would charge or you would you would put that in. You know, beneficiary's inheritance is not taxable. And an executor's compensation is taxable. Mm -hmm. So if you're an executor and you're a beneficiary, there's no point in taking money away from your non-taxable beneficiary self to give it to your executor self because that money is just going to be paid to the government. Mm -hmm. You said uh, estate tax is 1.5%. Is that on everything? Estate tax, yeah. It's, it's just a flat. Flat 1.5 on everything except for life insurance. Well, oh, or assets well, where, where you bypass to other beneficiaries or joint assets um, or assets like uh, registered assets that TFSAs, RSPs, if they pass directly to a beneficiary, they don't form they don't form part of the estate. And if they don't form part of the estate, there's no estate tax payable. You have, you have estate assets and you have non-estate assets. Yeah. That's the delineation. So, so it's it's on it's on estate assets. So an estate asset is a property you own in your sole name, a checking account or a savings account that you own in your sole name. That's um, right. Investment, but if you own it does get a little bit tricky here, but if you have an asset where you can designate a beneficiary, that's not an estate asset. It just goes directly to the beneficiary you've designated. If you have a spouse on a property who's a joint owner of that property and you pass away, not an estate asset. That goes to your surviving owner by right of survivorship. So you really have to take a look at, uh, and this again is one of the things that you know is helpful to see a lawyer to help you make these distinctions. But you have to, uh, and the financial planner, you know, like and it's it's a good idea to have your estate set up properly to minimize tax, um, and it's one and a half percent on all of your estate assets, so not everything, just the assets that fall into your estate. So the answer is complicated. <laughs> yeah. I guess it's complicated. It's yeah. not so complicated. Yeah, no, it is. Kind of, yeah, kind of. It's not a straight answer. But if you can designate a beneficiary, you're good. If you have a joint owner, often you are good. Not always, but often you are good. So, Richie, Catherine, uh, obviously we understand that wills are important. Wills start when somebody passes away. Yes. Uh, what about powers of attorney before there's a death? So powers of attorney, are there's two of them, and they're in effect before you pass away. So while you're still alive, there's two of them. One is for health care, and one is for property. And property is all assets, not just real property, not just in the house. So um, you can designate different people for those, but it's sort of similar considerations to when you're picking executors or when you're appointing people. You want to make sure it's someone you trust. Um, if you're appointing more than one, they, you better make sure that they get along, but there's different ways you can appoint them. You can do either or appointments, or you can appoint two, or you can appoint one first and someone back up. A lot of different considerations, but anyways, um, the importance of them is really, um, if you need them, it's good to have them because you don't want that up in the air if a bank is asking for it or if a healthcare professional really needs it and you want someone, you want to choose who's making these decisions for you and they can be very personal decisions. Um, that's really a, a time you definitely need to make sure you have these done. And it's always important to have them done sooner because I find a lot of the time is people call us and it may be too late to make it because you may have lost capacity by the stage your family member wants it done for you um, and they, they're out of luck and then they have to apply to the court and it's a huge headache and quite a lot of money for them to do it at that stage. So 
Yeah, I mean, I, that's exactly right. I think, you know, if you don't have powers of attorney and often powers of attorney get lost in the shuffle when people are talking about wills, but they are just as important as having, as having wills done. You should be having them up to date. You should be reviewing them just as often as you review your will. And uh, often we see what a mess it is if people don't have them and they need them. And uh, like Catherine said, in a worst case scenario, you're making a court application to be appointed um, and that's, you know, tens of thousands of dollars to do. And often they're needed on an urgent basis. Um, and, you know, you need lawyers who are very specialized in these types of applications and they're very busy and it's quite pricey and uh, you can avoid a lot of headaches by having them done uh, well in advance. And you can have your will and power of attorney done at the same time. And often yeah. they're done at the same time. Yeah. And we always Our you know, to do, we do them together. at the same time. Yeah. yeah. There's two types. So there's a power of attorney for property, a power of attorney for health. One is for um, appointing somebody to act on your behalf with respect to your finances. And another is for instructing doctors and nurses on your behalf if you can't. And it's important to have both. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, so before we bring up Jeff, uh, uh, Catherine and uh, and Richard touched on a couple of things, and I think it's really, really important to remember that this can be an overwhelming process mm -hmm. unless you have the right professionals helping you. There's obviously family that's very important. And on top of that, regardless of what the situation is that you're you're trying to accomplish, there are experts and finding somebody you trust to take care of those pieces for you and then having your whole team in place can take you from overwhelmed to overjoyed because all of a sudden you have everybody else taking care of the things that you couldn't think of taking care of. So it's really important to have that group of trusted professionals around you. And with that, Jeff? I'm ready. Awesome. I, I got some food. That's great. <laughs> the food looks great. Does anybody want like any more at the moment? There's soup, there's donuts, there's coffee. I'm gonna stand up. Sure. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Do you want me to get started, Irene? Do you want me to give it two minutes? Do you want me to give it two minutes for people to grab some oh, food? Sure. Or do you want me to just get yeah. started? Okay. Yeah. So I think you're going to get the app. Yeah. Okay. Good afternoon, and uh, thank you very much for having me, Irene, and thank you to Tapestry for having all of us here today. Um, my name's Jeff Hartley. I'm with RBC Dominion Securities, based in in downtown Toronto, and I'm a port senior portfolio manager and wealth advisor. And as we've just heard. Wealth advice can stretch across a lot of different avenues and, in fact, are, are very sort of intertwined. Um, and so when you when you hear from a will and estate lawyer or someone who does, does financial planning or someone like Irene who helps you with real estate decisions, um, I'm going to really sort of ex emphasize that whoever you're working with uh, in your life, make sure that Irene is speaking to Jeff, who's speaking to Richard and Catherine, who's speaking to the family. I mean, the more you can connect the people that are helping you, the more they can help you. Um, and and, and yeah, I'm just going to use an example that uh, that was just brought up about things like beneficiaries. So on my side, I manage investment accounts such as RSPs and TFSAs and the like, right? So we're always saying to our clients, make sure you assign a beneficiary so that either A, it won't be subject to probate further to your question, and or to make sure your assets obviously pass on to the people that you want them to. And you should also speak to a lawyer. 
And that's why where I'm saying there's 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 we each play a role in in in, in people's financial lives again whether it be real estate, financial assets, or will and estate planning, and those people should really be interconnected in terms of and aware of what what each other is doing. So I should know what the a prime example. If I have a client, I should know who the client's children are. I should know where the assets are going to be going if something were to happen all of a sudden. I should know who the powers of attorney are. I should know if there's a power of attorney in place because someone doesn't have mental capacity to make decisions, those types of things. So, so in my world, a lot of people think that that I sit here and go, hey, today's a great day to buy Microsoft shares. And it might be, but a lot of part of our job too is to think about these things that that probably people don't think about enough that are in the background, as in who my beneficiaries should be, those sorts of things. So so when you talk about, and, and feel free to interject as I go, um, and I'm standing today because I play. I have a six-year-old son who uh, who's learning squash, and, uh, and dad's body's getting a little more stiff as the uh, as the years go on, <laughs> and he's getting quick. Um, so that was this morning. Um, so in my role at RBC, when we work with someone who's thinking about downsizing a home or has a fam family member that's thinking about downsizing. We immediately think about three or four different things. Um, one, where are you going? <laughs> you have to live somewhere. So are you going to need are you going to need finances to to buy a subsequent property, or are you going to be to be moving into a senior's living place, or are you moving with family? Obviously, everybody's situation is very different. Um, second, do you have any debt? That you're going to be paying down and obviously we are in a world very very different than 18 months ago when interest rates were mm -hmm. basically two percent and now i just renegotiated my mortgage at six and a half and that's not ending anytime soon from what we can tell so is there any debt that needs to be retired if you're thinking about downsizing on a property um also at that point are there any, and so my background is I used to work at Ernst & Young in their tax group for about a decade before I, I, I did this role. So there's always a little, little person on my shoulder reminding me, what are the tax implications of what you're saying? Um, is there funds from a, a downsize that could be used to maximize a tax-free savings account that you've not used previously? Or do you have, do you have any RSP room if you're still able to contribute? And or do you want to gift, we talked about gifts just briefly, do you want to gift money to, to somebody in your life? And, you know, I work with people, my youngest client is in his 20s. My oldest client is my grandmother, who's 98. Um, by working with people at all different decades, we, we see in stages of life, we see these decisions sort of evolve. And I can say, and the reason I brought up gift is that in some cases, it may make sense to gift certain assets if you're downsizing to family members so you can actually see them enjoy it, as opposed to when you pass away, assets move on, but you don't get to see you don't get to, to, to see them enjoy it as much. Food for thought, it's something that I have seen a lot in my business because obviously we have clients that get older and pass away. And usually the surviving spouse is saying, I wish we did this, or I wish I could have thought about this and enjoyed some of that, that money that could come from a downsize earlier. Um, so paying down debt, gifting, putting money towards a new property, maybe you hire Irene and you look at an income producing okay. property. I'm just saying. <laughs> yeah. I have a question. Yes, about, for sure. About the, the gifting. Um, yeah. So you can, you can see the benefit of those funds with your children and grandchildren. Uh, there are no tax implications if you do the gifting while you're alive, correct? Yeah, give, give, there's no gift. There's gift tax in the United States, but there's no gift tax per se uh, in Canada. Um, that's a big thing. Yeah, yeah, for sure. The there are some tax. That's a that's a a general statement. And then again, my accounting background says remember to tell people this. If you've got really, if you've got minors. Especially, there are attribution rules in Canada that say if you give money to say a a fifteen year old, they're they're the tax if if that money is invested and there's income earned on that money, 
the parent, and let's use you, Irene, as an example, if you've given money, you might be the one still taxable on that money if it's given to somebody that's that's a minor, as an example. But if it's a, an adult child and, and you're helping them buy a house or something like that, then the answer is generally no, there's no tax implications. Is there yep. limits on the distance? Nope. No, and there's, I mean, in, again, in Canada, there's a lot of you can you can set up a trust, you can you can look at other structures to 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 not just do an outright gift, but to to give money to somebody with certain parameters, um, and I'm sure the the lawyers would be better better equipped to 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 respond to that. But in general, if you're just gifting money and saying here, uh, there's not not a limit per se. And you and you will if you get say your car. Yep. To somebody. Does that mean it's not part of probate? I don't think a car is part of probate anyways, is it? If you're probating, if you're probating otherwise, then you have to include everything. Got it. If you're not probating otherwise, then the car would not be included. So if you die and the only thing you want is a car, and the car is worth five thousand dollars, then you can go to the Ministry of Ontario and sign a car over. Again, assuming that having a will makes it easier, so with everything else. Because it's fifty thousand dollars, and but you will have to go for the same last time. Still fifty thousand dollars. So the, you, you, the only reason you have to probate again is if an asset is frozen, mm -hmm. and if you can't transfer the car over without probate, somebody is requiring you to probate. You go to Ministry of Ontario. This wouldn't happen. But if you went to Ministry of Ontario and they said we're not letting you transfer the car unless you get probate, then you would have to do it, and you would have to include the car. So if the car is the only asset, you're okay. But if you have a house that you own in your sole name and the car, then you're including both. They say if you're in for a penny, you're in for a pound. So if you include one thing, you got to include everything. I got confused with beneficiaries. Right, yes. Understood it was to avoid property. Let me take a crack at that one. Okay. So, so, so I have a client, you're my client, and you have some, some, some bank accounts and investment accounts, right? Yeah. And you'd mentioned that non-registered non stuff is owned, owned jointly. Yes. So if you were to predecease your spouse, those assets don't go through probate, they pass over. If you have a beneficiary on a registered account, like a tax-free savings account or a RIF or something like that, same thing, they will pass over and not have to go through COVID. There might be personal tax implications with some of these things, right? But they're not going to go through probate. So, so Richard had divided the two buckets. Probate yeah, assets yeah. that go through probate and assets that don't. Sorry, a beneficiary in your will is not the same as designating right. a beneficiary oh. of an RSP. Or no, I understand. Yeah, thanks. Exactly. So if you if you have an account with me and we've said, okay, your your wife's the beneficiary, your spouse is the beneficiary then it won't go through probate. Thanks. But if we don't put that on our side at RBC, and it go, then basically the government has to look at the will and say, okay, where does this money go? Then it goes through probate. Yeah, I have a scenario for you. Uh, Carrie says, well, what's the difference if the parents own the house, they passed away, and now the house goes to the children versus um, they own the house, they sell the house before they pass away, and they give the money. Uh, if you give the money, then I guess you have to take it, but what about if you keep the property? Yeah, not a whole lot of difference from a tax perspective. I assume this is their principal residence. Yeah, so this is a principal residence, and if they were to pass away before selling it, then there's no tax implications on having it as a principal residence. Mm -hmm. And and then basically the the executor of the I'm I'm, I'm a little in, in an area of the pond I'm not as familiar on the legal side but the executor would basically decide what's going to happen to that property and then what happens with the funds after that and they'd be distributed. Uh, I I think because I I'm pretty sure I know what you're asking Cam the 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 difference would be if the owner passes away then the house becomes part of it has to be probated and it's part of the piece that's going to be uh, a tax for the state tax versus if they sell it, if they're principal residents, there's no tax at all, then they have the asset of the money and they can just gift that to the Is that the question of a probate? Yeah, okay. it's still one, 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 one. Yeah. 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 
still so one and a half so percent of one point five million. <laughs> no, because it was no, because it was the, the parents' principal residence. Yeah. So again, probate part aside. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. But if there's no no death, there's no probate. Yeah. So, so yeah, so I wanted to make, just given the previous presenters, I just wanted to make sure that there's, that there was that understanding that, that it is important that your financial institutions are, know who the beneficiaries are for your various accounts so that, so that you have the ability to not have to pay probate or sorry, your, whoever is involved doesn't have to pay probate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or a joint owner. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, not, not, not a sorry, not a not a bank. Sorry, a registered account, not a bank account. Okay, you could have a joint a owner on a bank account. account. Yeah, no, no, no. Sorry, no. you could have a joint owner though. You could be the joint owner with a spouse or a parent. Yep. Okay, so if the parents had uh, the children on as joint owners, and the parents passed away, mm -hmm. they just flow through the children on the just one neighbor. Yeah, there's some planning to be done there, but yes, in general, yes. I, I would just say, if you're thinking about doing that, to talk to Jeff or talk to a lawyer because there are some implications to consider yeah. when you're adding people with joint owners to your accounts. Yeah. It's not the easy solution that a lot of people think it is. <laughs> so, so they can draw a lot of If those people, the people you add, if they have debt, you got it. You have to trust the people you're yeah. adding on as joint right. owners. Two, two, two main things to worry about. Draw. <laughs> yeah. Two main worries because we get this question a lot. First worry, do you trust the person you're adding, even if it's a family member? And second one is that you can't just, by adding another name to a, to an, a bank account or an investment account, there it goes down two paths depending on how it's structured. One path is you're just adding a name and it's more so for, for probate planning purposes. But another one, it can be looked at as you've actually transferred 50% of those assets to the other person immediately. And there can be tax implications on that. Mm -hmm. Yes. Probably wouldn't happen in the Not if it's just pure cash, agreed. Yeah. But say it's an investment account where there was a uh, stock that had gone up in value, right? Yeah. Sounds like for the next seminar, we need an accountant here too. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> I'm only 11 years rusty now, so. <laughs> on the bank account, there's two. There used to be two versions of joint, right? Yes. And, and or, right? It's, Is it's that still true? Pretty kind of, yeah. So again, there's there's ones where you've got there's it's called beneficial ownership. So basically, does the other person have beneficial ownership of those assets? Can they draw money from it? Can they spend it? That sort of thing, or are they simply on there without beneficial ownership? Mm -hmm. Or I, I think so, but yeah, th but those are the two categories. Again, does the other person have the ability to use the money or not? Great questions. Thank you, everybody. Yeah. Um, yes. One more question uh, to follow on Pam's. So what if that, that said house, the parents passed away, um, could they have written in their will that they pass that house ownership onto their children? I'll pass that up. That's probably. I know 1.5%. Yeah, so there is hope. Yeah, things to get away from that. What if the children move to that house? It's time. Honestly, we should have a whole other presentation. Just be glad you don't live in the U.S. Because U.S. estate tax is not one and a half percent. I can tell you that. Granted, they have quite a big exemption, but it's uh, a lot more expensive. Um, yeah, basically, just anything that you've written in your will goes through probate. No matter what you say, there it's just the stuff you do before your will that potentially avoids probate again, like a, like assigning a beneficiary on an investment account. Um. So what do we? The point about what do we do with our clients when they're thinking about downsizing or they're thinking about some of these these longer term decisions for themselves or family members? Um, we we basically use a, a financial planning tool that we have to project out where the cash flows are going to go, what debt's going to get paid off, 
whether some money should be gifted or not, whether funds should be invested, um, and, and, and really help plot out or create a roadmap for these decisions so that you're in a position for yourself or the family member to say, okay, here's my three or four different options. And these are the ones that end up the most that, that are that are optimal for me, given given tax, given probate, given investments, given interest rates, all the things that I've talked about. So we, we can tell from the, the previous discussion and from this discussion that there are a lots of different things to, to think about. And in some cases, those things actually bump up against each other. There's a bit of a tug of war. I might create a bit of extra tax, but then I get to see my family enjoy the money. I might uh, I might be able to, to, to defer tax, but then what happens when I pass away? There's always a give, you know, give and take with respect to these things, trade-offs in everything in life. So that's what this financial planning is meant to do is to talk about the trade-offs and figure out what's the best way to move forward with, with a downsizing decision, whether again, if it, if it yields extra cash or if it means that you have to alter some of your planning, including your finances and your will and estate planning, okay? I'm gonna to touch on an, any questions so far or any other questions? We'll pause for a second. Yep. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> so if we had the house and we kept the house and we passed it to and the children would just one of the kids, right? They would have two houses. If they, if they sold that house that they were just preparing for us five years, would they then be subject to this kind of principal residence? Potentially, they, yes. They yes. Would yes. yes. Yeah, because you can't claim the principal. So you can't. Where, what would they calculate the tax implications on? The total value? Uh, yeah, well, I think this is where Irene was asking about that December 1st example in the previous discussion. Mm -hmm. So when the parents passed away in that example, effectively, they're not subject to tax anymore, obviously. So any growth in the value of the property after that point is really subject to tax. Well, after that point, it wouldn't be from the, not the whole it, time. It wouldn't be from the date that the parents were. No. Um, okay. No, so 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 if you if you look at more recent, like if this happened, if this happened now, you know they probably have made the value of the property over the last twenty years has probably gone up a lot. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's come down in the recent year, um, but but it would be only the time after they pass that would be subject to tax in that example or your scenario. Yeah, Jeff, I have a question because you mentioned cash flow. So tell me if this is something we're we're still planning to talk about. Yep. Uh, one big question that we get often, especially if somebody's been living in their home for 30, 40, 50 years, is if they're not purchasing again and they do want to go into a, a retirement community or someplace else where they do have uh, a substantial monthly um, outlay that they have to pay for mm -hmm. their, their accommodation, uh, how can you help uh, someone understand uh when they sell that asset and it is tax free because it's their principal mm -hmm. residence, how is it going to fund 10 years, 15, 20, everybody's living longer, everybody's healthier. When you're in an environment like this, you're very active, there's a lot to do. So chances are you're going to live longer. Yeah. So, so how can you easily explain how that money will work for them? Yeah. And that's really the, the, and thank you for that. The, the tool that I mentioned helps us plot out that that roadmap, right? So if you have a lump sum of money, and this would really apply to anybody that's selling a property, if you have a lump sum of money that you're 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 freeing up from selling real estate, which is more of an illiquid asset if you think about it, and now putting it into something that's more liquid, an investment account as an example. Um, what we would do is really understand what your cash flow requirements are. What are your expenses? What are your outflows? Right? Do you have any other inflows like pensions from either the government or or a company? What are the inflows versus the outflows? And then when we plot this out, we would set up a strategy to basically generate income from the portfolio, from an investment portfolio to fund your expenses. So picture getting a paycheck from your own investment assets on a monthly basis that were to Irene's question that would pay your monthly seniors fees or your um, your gym expenses, or really could be anything. So the idea is that we're generating an income flow from the cash that we freed up from the sale of, of the real estate. And our job 
is not only to invest that and try and generate that return, but also do it in a very tax efficient manner. Why do I say that? A two-year GIC right now pays about 5.8%. That was about 2%, again, 18 months ago. 5.8% GIC is interest income, which, which is and, and it's guaranteed very low risk, but it's taxed at your top rate. Mm -hmm. So even though you see 5.8%, you're probably not keeping 5.8%. There's The government's getting their hand in on a piece of that. Mm -hmm. So what do we do? Maybe we can use dividends. Maybe we can use what's called return of capital. Maybe we can look at an in investing in an insurance policy. There are, are other ways to save tax in Canada and still come to a, the same outcome in terms of your cash flows. So that's the type of thing that we would do. I mean, I'll, I'll talk about my parents in a second here. So my parents, my mother worked at a, mm -hmm. it's probably the best way to do it. She's part of, of who? The hospital pension. She worked at Scarborough General Hospital her whole career as a um, in actually in a, in a number of different roles um but physiotherapist was her main one and so when she retired she gets a pension every year still for the rest of her life she'll get a pension from the hospital it's an okay pension they have a lot of other expenses my father uh did not have a pension uh from from his job and so they they live in markham they've lived in the same house that i grew up in and they're saying, should we sell this house? Because there's a bunch of capital. It's, it's We've got no debt left. There's a bunch of capital here. We don't need the space. There's no kids here anymore. In fact, there's more grandkids coming in. Um, what do we do with this? And, and, and I'm talking to my parents about this right now, saying, if you guys decide to do that, you can free up cash from your house, right? They're saying they want to downsize and, and move way up north, though. That part I don't like so much, but it's, uh, <laughs> they're saying they want to buy a place that's a lot cheaper, but very far, very, very far away. Um, in that case, though, if they did that, they could take money from their house, invest it, and they you're, you're effectively creating your own pension. You're creating an income stream from, from assets that, that are currently illiquid, again, real estate, and turning it into something that's liquid. Yes. It worries me about investing that huge sum of money is perhaps losing it. And the great, great worry, especially with the with, with the vol amount of volatility we've seen over the last couple of years. That's why I like GICs. And and here's a here's a major. I'll spend two minutes on this. Uh, I I thought it would probably come up. The my job is very different. And I've been doing this for 12 years, but investing in conservative assets like GICs and bonds, the opportunity to do that hasn't been like this since for A, first before the global financial crisis in 2008, and probably more so about three decades, as in interest rates are, are have come up. So a, a two-year GIC, I just, I, I just bought one on uh, yesterday for a client, 5.8% for the next two years, guaranteed. There are a number of other bond investments and, and lower risk vehicles that pay five, six, in some cases like six and a half percent. And again, a year and a half ago, they were not, they did not exist. Mm -hmm. Those were paying two. So to your point, what's happened with interest rates is a benefit for a lower risk investor because you may not now need to take as much risk to generate a higher return. If we're setting up a monthly income flow, a GIC wouldn't work because it doesn't spit out income monthly, but that could still be definitely a piece of the plan, 100%. And you don't have to take the same level of risk that you would have even two years ago to, to achieve the same result. If you're in your age or too old for annuities? Um, probably. Uh, but again, as interest rates go up, the terms on these annuities get more attractive. And you can also have annuities that pass on to the to, to somebody else. Like there's 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 a number of different setups for annuities. Um, I still think they're too expensive for what they are, especially if you can go out and buy a GIC or buy some other more liquid investments that are going to to achieve a, a similar result. Yeah, I would say either Jim and, and for anyone else, it's really important going back to your team having the right team around you when it comes to whatever the topic is and finances, especially you want to be working with somebody who can gauge where you are and what your risk tolerance is and what you should be 
uh, where you should be listening, where you shouldn't. So that yeah. you know, at certain age groups, you need you need a lot less risk and still be able to have whether it's the cash flow investment or whatever. So it's the person that you trust to take care of that to make sure that they understand where you are and what what your goals are, so that they can take care of you at different stages of your life instead of just selling you. <laughs> Yeah, I'll, I'll make, can I make two sort of follow-up comments? Am I okay? How, how much time yeah, do I have? Okay. That, that, what Irene just said, I cannot, that's very powerful. Um, and my job is like, same as, same as the speakers before me. It's about building that trust. You have to, it, it, we have, I have a fiduciary duty to my clients to make sure that they're taken care of as best they can. Two things that I wanted to emphasize. One we do find we do these plans that I'm talking about, and they're hard to explain in front of a, a room or, or or on the computer. But when you do a plan, it says, okay, if I earn five percent for the rest of my life, I'm comfortable, and then there's a bunch of money that I get to pass on to kids or charitable organizations or whatever. So let's use five percent as a number. Well, five percent again two years ago meant that generally you'd have to take some risk because if a GIC is paying two. There's the simple math. I can't get to five with, with a GIC. I have to take some, some incremental risk. For every single client we work with, whether they're 20 or 98, we are taking less risk today than we are 18 months ago for that exact reason. Because everybody's plan says that they need a certain level of return. And that, that amount of return is now more achievable through some other investments other than just the stock market. And that could be GICs, bonds, private debt, also real estate, a, a number of different things. Second point, uh, used to be sort of a rule of thumb that whatever your age is, and this is my father that told me this, whatever your age is, that should be the amount of fixed income or conservative investments in your portfolio. So if you're 80, 80% 80 of your assets should be in GICs and in very conservative investments. I can tell you that in my job, you can't say that every just as 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 the team before was saying everybody's situation is different what if somebody that's 80 is still really healthy and wants to spend a bunch of money what if somebody that's 80 says i I'm, I'm very comfortable i'm now investing not for me but for the generation after me right so so everybody's situation is really different and there is no quote unquote sort of rule of thumb but in general we are in an environment right now where I challenge everybody in the rooms to, to speak to their people that help them out or, or look at your own finances and say, do I really need to take this level of risk moving forward because interest rates have come up so much and I can actually make a decent return, a very good return, in fact, on lower risk investments. I know that's not tied to downsizing, but it's an important message. Yeah. I'm good. That's what I had. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. I love doing these seminars because every time we host one, I learn something. <laughs> <laughs> um, and we really, uh, we really look to have speakers that will bring value as opposed to just, just sort of recite uh, data because it's really important for us to take care of our real estate clients and put the team in place around us to take care of each other component, each of the components of, of the rest of their situation. Okay, so we've covered your legals, we've covered your finances, and where are you going to move? If you want to move from your home and you want something a little bit smaller, something a little bit less maintenance, the options are plentiful. And uh, it's sometimes hard to make a decision. So I'm going to bring up uh, Lisa Holland uh, from Tapestry. You are the director yes, of sales. Director of sales. So Lisa, yes, please take the floor. You. Thank you again for providing us this wonderful room. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm Lisa. So I work here at Tapestry at Village Gate West. So we are an independent, like active aging seniors living community. So there are a bunch of different living options in that whole like retirement realm for, for senior living. So some of them are just straight independent living where there are no services, things like that. So it's almost like a, like a condo for seniors almost. Then there are some other places 
um, independent living with some assistance, so some supportive living. Then there's all assisted living. So that would be things that have like just specifically dedicated to memory care, for instance. And then we have long-term care as well. So that's more kind of like government sort of funded those, those sort of communities there. Um, so there's all a place for them in society because we people can meet them at different points in life and different people may need them. So our community here, so we are independent living, but we do have some supportive assistance for people who do need it if and when that time comes. Um, it's not to say that everybody needs it because like Irene said before, when you do move into a community, um, all of like the services and the amenities and things that you have available to you, it, it and like the social aspect, the food, all of these sorts of things just, just helps. Um, we see such a change in people and it's like the stress that's kind of taken away that you can actually enjoy what you've worked for. And it's not to say that we have housekeeping in place because you can't do it. That's not it at all. We can have housekeeping put in place so that you can have the time back to be doing something that you actually want to be doing. So here, for instance, with um, like the gym, the pool, all of the exercise classes, all of the outings, everything that we do, that's just all part of daily life here. Um, and so a lot of times when people are coming in for a tour originally, or even just on the phone in the first place, and they're looking, they're just kind of starting their research. And that's the best thing to do is start early to kind of know what's out there because so many people are absolutely floored when they come in for a tour or to do this initial research of just calling and, and finding out about different places about what's out there. And there's a very, there could be like a very negative perception about what communities used to look like 10, 20 years ago compared to what they are now. So it's it could be like a very clinical setting, for instance, whereas somewhere like here, you walk in, you know, oh, there's a pool, there's a gym, there's this, there's that, valet parking, okay, great. So all of these things um, are just, are things that you learn about as you go through this process. Uh, and so I always say, just start to think about uh, what's what's important to you, where you see yourself right now, and kind of start to ask questions about what you want to look for going forward. So that could be something like the community that you wanna live in, like the neighborhood. Is that something important to you? Do you wanna stay in the neighborhood? We've had people who used to live here and they retired somewhere else and then they're moving back or maybe they're moving to the neighborhood because their kids are here or they've just lived in the area all their life. And so all of these different pieces come into play. So think about, things that are important to you? Do you want it to be accessible to transit or have some sort of transportation? Um, what type of social engagement are you looking for? If if food is important to you, and this is a good tidbit, anywhere that you go, when, it, when you do go for a tour, always try the food. <laughs> that is extremely important, regardless of where it is. And don't be afraid to ask anywhere that you go, to talk with either residents who live there or different members of management, because it just helps give you a picture of what the community and what the living and the setting is like. So here I always say, come talk with our chef, talk with residents, because actually hearing it from somebody who lives it makes a big difference. <laughs> and so with the different options that there are in, in senior living, like I was saying, that there are places that do have um, focus more so on assisted living. Um, so those types of places, when you do go for a tour, and granted some people do need them if it's like a locked memory care floor, things like that, just be mindful that when you do go or if you think like, oh, I need to move to a community like this because I might, I might, like this might happen to me, I might get dementia or I might have X, Y, Z. You kind of have to think about where you are now because if you do go into a community that maybe focuses on that, that could make somebody decline a lot faster mm -hmm. because that's where the focus and the priority is. Whereas if you're in a community that's more engaged and you have other, other uh, priorities around, it can kind of help sustain where you are today and kind of maintain that. Um, and moving into a community, like I said, it's not anything about taking away independence. That's the last thing. It's about maintaining that independence to have that. Uh, so I know we've been, we've been lucky enough to work with, with Irene and, and 
um, so many other great assets like that we do have in and around us to kind of help people know what options there are. Because some people say, oh, I'm not ready for it. I'm not ready. So a good question to ask, well, what does ready look like? Are you going to wait for something to happen before you make this move and then you're not the you're not the decision maker and you might not be in the driver's seat for that decision so starting that research soon and actually going in for a tour and and um looking at all the different options is really important because it gives you a good outlook on what's available uh, so things that are kind of important to understand is when you're going when you are going through this process uh, like we talked about finding out about social connections, like what social engagement opportunities are there, uh, the food, health and wellness. And like I said, um, a lot of communities that they do have like a nursing staff just available. And it's also like a safety, a safety feature as well, like knowing the neighborhood, knowing who's here at all hours and all the different parties that are involved with it. So it's it's important to, to know um, Kind of like plan your questions ahead of time too and and know what you're trying to get out of making a move so you don't want to make a move because you think oh i have to do this because my son or my daughter is telling me to do it you have to be open to it as well because what you put into it that's what you're going to get out because you meet so many different people here and that's something that i definitely love about my job is getting to know all the different people that are that are coming, their background. And it's interesting to see there's a gentleman who moved in and um, he was in the hall one day and there was a woman who was passing by and she said, are you Dave? Like, did you live at this address? And it turns out when he had his first divorce that he moved into this woman's house in like one of her, in her and I think it was in her basement and they hadn't seen each other in like 35 years mm -hmm. and all of a sudden passing through the hallway here. So that was, that was really sweet. So mm -hmm. it's, it's different. It's so interesting to see how, how it all comes together and, and different people um, getting to, getting to meet each other. So I know something that's, you, you wouldn't expect all of the different things that, that people do. And I always say age is just a number because we've had 90 year olds do our CN Tower edge walk with us, went zip lining in Niagara Falls. We have a woman here who's 98, her name is Callis and she is still an Olympic swimmer. Mm -hmm. So um, she holds world records, she's swimming every day. She thinks our pool is a joke and she still goes <laughs> to the Olympium. But she'll she'll wait around in there, but it's it's pretty amazing. So um, and that's kind of what community living can do. It's it's helping you embrace embrace that age and just keep going. Like, why not? And like I said, there's just there's so many different opportunities and ways to become involved. And just because you're moving to a community doesn't mean that you're giving something up. A lot of times uh, we'll have influencers so let's say children for instance um there it's kind of like caregiver burnout and the parent might not even realize it at that point and so moving to a community it kind of takes that away so you can actually enjoy the time that you're spending together with the with with your family instead of every time that someone comes over and they're immediately scanning the room looking around the house this has to be done that has to be done oh we need to call someone in to do this or the snow removal, like, et cetera, et cetera. So it's nice to actually have that time and to come to a place where you're proud to still call home. Um, and just because you are moving doesn't mean, like I said, that you have to give things up. There's still gardens that you can maintain if you like to. Um, you can start committees, you can be part of groups. Like there's a lot of opportunities with that. Awesome. Any questions so far? Awesome, Lisa. Thank you so much. Perfect. So, here I am. Uh, Teresa is uh, is uh, generally the the gal that's uh, uh, doing this portion of the seminar. So I will do my best to relay as much as I possibly can to you and uh, direct you to the right right people, and. You know, like, like Lisa mentioned, uh, it's so important to figure out first 
what your plan will be and where it is that you want to go. Uh, it's very common to have a lot of stuff. Who has a lot of stuff in their house? <laughs> Who has too much stuff in their house? So sometimes, I think we had a, a hand raised on Zoom too. Sometimes it can be daunting to think about a move because you don't know what to do with all of your stuff. And especially if you've been living in the same house for a really long time, the longer you're there, the more difficult it can be. So figuring out what your next steps will be will go a long way in helping you then deal with, with your stuff because you know where you're going. So that's that's very critical, whether you're coming into a retirement community and, and you'll have the, the support there or, you know, in, in Jeff's case, maybe, maybe getting out of town, uh, which is always a possibility. But starting with a plan is, is really, really critical. Uh, so figuring out that lifestyle piece is what will drive the rest of what it is that you're going to be doing. The next really important piece is to make sure you don't do it alone. We've talked a lot today about having the right team in place, having the right professionals in place. Trying to do something of this magnitude on your own could be even, like it could really set you into overwhelm. Family is great. Enlisting family and friends, obviously, that's where you may want to start. Uh, but there are so many other professionals in different capacities that can help you, uh, whether it is a professional organizer, a downsizing expert who will start with you at your home, figure out where it is that you're going, and then help you with all of the decisions to take you there. Uh, there's auction companies that, that can help you deal with your valuables. Uh, much like everything else today, everything is really, really personal. And the most important thing for you is to figure out who it is that's going to help you. Because trying to figure out the how is going to be much more difficult than figuring out the who. So if you have the who, if you have the professionals that you can call on to help you make these decisions, uh, everything will be uh, a lot, a lot more straightforward for you. Uh, we've also put together, uh, it was very last minute, so we have put together a lot of tips that we can share with you. We just didn't have enough time to print them for your manuals. So if there is anybody that wants a more in-depth version of what we're talking, what I'm talking about right now, please let me know and we can get that over to you. When you're thinking about what to get rid of and what to take with you, you do want to think about not taking all of the clutter from your existing house and bringing it into your next one. Uh, it can happen. It can happen. So uh, sometimes it's difficult to think about where it is that you're going to downsize to because you're thinking about your stuff. Where's my stuff going to go? So it's really important to figure out exactly what it is that you're going to be taking with you uh, and have that pave the way for how you're going to make the transition. Uh, so in a nutshell, one of the things that Lisa had mentioned is, is starting your search early for what it is that you're, where it is that you're going to be moving to. Doing the same with your possessions is really, really critical if you have the ability to do that. So if you're starting to think, you know, you're here today, you're thinking maybe two, three years down the road, you'll be ready to move from your bigger home. Start today. Start looking at what you have. It's a lot easier to get rid of things slowly than it would be to, to be under the gun for a move. I remember a couple of years ago, I was dealing with uh, a, a woman in her mid sixties whose mom had gone into a residence. She was still alive, uh, but she was not able to, to deal with any of, of uh, her possessions. And the house was pretty full. It was quite full. And uh, the, my client in, in her sixties was angry. She said, took my mother a lifetime of collecting all of these items. And because she didn't throw anything out, I now have to get rid of them in a matter of weeks. And uh, it was really, really hard on her. So starting the process earlier so that uh, you have the time to do that is, is really beneficial. And then you can figure out what is valuable. What is, what is it that you can actually potentially get some money for? Can you option it? The challenge for, for so many, uh, so many people now is a lot of their possessions were worth a lot when they purchased them. And unfortunately in today's environment, they may not be. 
but again, bringing someone else, someone in who can help you determine what's valuable and what isn't. What can you donate? What can you give to family? Uh, some folks do want their possessions to be carried on in uh, with their, their children and grandchildren, and the children and grandchildren don't always want their stuff. Sometimes they're cherished possessions, and sometimes what you know you thought was valuable is not valuable to the rest of your family, which is really hard because you've had these items for such a long time and they meant so much to you. Um, but it's it, it's not it's not always easy to to make sure that they have another place to live. So again, bringing in the right people who can tell you what's really valuable and what is it that uh, you will you will need to to just find another home for that may not be your family. Taking a full inventory is really important too as you go from room to room, figuring out exactly what you have and uh, packing. Also, if you're looking at the move of the whole house, it could be daunting. Whereas if you focus on individual rooms, today I'm going to do the living room. Next week, I'm going to do the kitchen and pack things up so that everything is organized and you're not trying to deal with the whole house at once. Uh, the sentimental items we talked about, taking one room at a time, uh, getting rid of duplicates. I think some of us are guilty of having more than one of, of certain things, so that's important as well. Digitizing photographs. We're living in a digital world, world and uh, the big photo albums that we used to have uh, are, are hard to, to store, uh, and, and putting those photos on... Uh, somehow digitize, digitizing them uh, will certainly take up a lot of space. I am guilty. I go the other way. I take a whole bunch of photos and then I print them and put them in photo albums. And my husband makes fun of me every time I do this. We have shelves and shelves and shelves of the photos that I've taken over the last 30 years. I don't know what I'm going to do when it comes to that point. Of course. What if you do all those photos and look at the photos and say, I don't understand these people are with their families, <laughs> but you just send me home. <laughs> I think just, I just keep it, but I there. digitize them, put them in the cloud. They'll be there somewhere. Somebody will find them. Somebody will know who that is. <laughs> <laughs> or, or you take the time to, to go through it. You enjoy looking at that, that memory and then. Well, they are. <laughs> they can live where we want it. <laughs> uh, another uh, often overlooked activity and it is important is measuring the furniture that you have that you think you want to take with you there's uh the, the concept of okay i don't need all of this space i don't need this maintenance i want a smaller place i want smaller space uh, but then going from that idea into the reality sometimes sometimes doesn't match and especially if you have some some favorite furniture pieces uh, so measuring the furniture that you think you want to take and making sure that you bring those measurements into your next place and make sure it fits that's important for sure um, donating giving away items of course and then storage options you know sometimes you may not take the items with you um, you may consider putting them in storage uh, just remember, you might be paying for storage for items that you're never going to use. Mm -hmm. uh, so that we're just going to circle back. You know, we're always circling back to the who. So whoever you enlist to help you, if it's a family member, make sure they're objective. If it's a professional, make sure that they have the project management skills to help you with that. Um, because just like in real estate and in finance and in law, there are people who are licensed to do those things. And there's people who are really good at those things and can really help you with your particular situation. Um, and that's really important when it comes to your stuff, especially and you want somebody who has the empathy, uh, whether you're dealing with your own items or those of, of family members, they need to have the empathy to help with the emotional piece, uh, as well as the project management to help with the practical piece. So those two things are not easy to find in one person. So that's really important when you're interviewing for who's gonna help you. I always end up with the who. It's always the who, <laughs> finding the who. <laughs> any questions on this piece? Yes. Jim? Do you have any uh, opinion on uh, downsizers like Max Soul? Yes. 
Yeah. Yes. Uh, I, I will tell you, um, Max sold, well, there's the, I'll, I'll speak to Max sold specifically because there are different auction houses and liquid liquidators. Uh, I find Max sold is great if you have items that are probably not very valuable. Uh, because uh, the the auction process, and I've gone through it now twice with different clients, you really don't get a lot of money for the items. So if you have a whole house full of junk, it's great because people will buy anything. I've had, so I'll, I'll, and uh, you're smiling, but it is so true. It's, it can be heart-wrenching. We've had two cases where one house was almost all junk and the other house had things that were, they weren't antiques. They weren't, you know, crazily valuable, but they were really nice. And we ended up with less money for those items than we did with the house full of junk. Will they get rid of stuff that doesn't sell? No. What do you do with that? Just junk. <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll tell you though, uh, it's, you know, when, you, when you're looking at your items, you, you want to figure out, are they valuable to you or are they valuable in, in, in reality? Mm -hmm. Um, any money that you get from any sort of auction house or liquidator or anything like that, any money you get will be double the money that you actually get because then that you're not paying to get rid of those items. Okay. Junk removal services are expensive. When you add on top of that, the emotion of throwing something out that you really think should get some use from, for, from someone else, it's kind of a double whammy. But there are so many of them. There's, you know, right now I can't think of, of any of the other names, but they're all sell your stuff. And not near us is one called um, an estate sale and bury. There's so many of them. Uh, the 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 good thing about Max Sold is is they have two different programs, and one of them they will actually come in and catalog price and uh, catalog and price everything for you. It's very hands off. Um, and if you just don't want to deal with it, it's great. Another really concern I have usually about this, we live in a condo you where know, you have to have a key to get in, for example, or somebody busts you up. How do they handle 50 or 60 people coming in to collect all this stuff? I don't know. I've never done a condo. Oh, no. I imagine if you call them, though, they will have a very clear answer for you. Thanks. Yeah. Along the lines, I can see that um, Teresa has let's say an auction here. Do you know what what kind of thing she has? She will she will come in and she will assess the items to determine if they are if they have an intrinsic value that she can get from an auction, as opposed to something that's just sentimentally valuable. I'm sorry. It's not an auction house or anything. Um, it, 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 it's not an auction house. Uh, it, it is an auction process. It's, it's not dissimilar to Max Sold. It's just a little bit more elevated. We've actually had a few residents who have used her and her services for it. Um, she actually even did an event here and we kind of did like an antiques roadshow type event. So people had brought things down for her to kind of go through. And it was a good wake up call for some people to know, well, I've had this item for X amount of years. It was my mom's. And it's not worth anything, whereas something else it could be worth quite a lot. And then for even uh, with residents moving in, that she's gone to their home, does like an assessment with the items that are there, and then um, she can figure out if it's worth it to have like a lot on its own, so that you can have people coming over, or if it's kind of bunched together and it can be online and it can be in person as well. And this is, again, where it's so important to have the right person with the right skills mm -hmm. for something like this, because you need someone that will be able to determine if there's enough value there, enough financial value, um, to go through the process. She also said, important to have you a secure plan in place. You know what that's a secure plan. I'm just curious about that. Not off the top of my head right now. Spot, give her, <laughs> give her, a, give her about a week to recover, and then you can give her a call. Okay, thanks. Anyone else? No. 
Well, folks, thank you so much. Thank you for coming. Uh, thank you for hosting speakers. So thank you very much for your wisdom. Uh, those of you online or watching the recording, thank you for tuning in with us. And uh, there's still more food if you'd like to eat more. And uh, anyone else, if you'd like to stick around, happy to chat with you.